Good afternoon. This is my pleasure to moderate the next second wave webinar. My name is Mazin Naga, professor from Internal Medicine, Cairo University. It's my pleasure to welcome you all in this interesting webinar. I wish to thank AstraZeneca to give me the chance to be with you. With my thanks to Royal Training Center for the organization of the meeting. In this webinar, we will have two lectures. The first is about managing GI cancer by the first house Maruf from Brazil. The second, about management metric ulcer leading by Professor Amin Yossi from Egypt, followed by hands on session on GI bleeding by Dr. Ahmed Tumbari to Pakistan. Now, let us introduce and welcome our first speaker, Professor Fawzi Maruf from Brazil. He is the director of the Endoscopy Unit of uh, Cancer Institute of Sao Paulo, Department of Gastroenterology of the University of Sao Paulo, Associate Editor of the Gastroenterology Endoscopy. Chair of the Scientific Committee of Brazilian Society for GI Endoscopy. Dr. Malouf, welcome you with us in Cairo. Hoping the situation of Corona in Brazil to improve soon. Please send my greetings to all my friends in Brazil, especially Dr. Mauro Sakai and Dr. Adriana Ribeiro. Now, uh, in the lecture with management of GI cancers. Thank you. Okay. So, good morning, everyone from Sao Paulo. Thank you. Professor Naga for this kind introduction uh, and thank you for the invitation to Roya and to AstraZeneca. So uh, I'm very glad to be here today. And my task is to talk in the next 20 minutes about the endoscopic management of GI cancers. I believe you can see my screen. This is my conflict of interests. And I'm gonna talk about detection of early uh, for GI cancer and treatment of early uh, for GI cancer. So about detection, endoscopic detection of early upper GI cancer. Are we doing a good job? And the answer, unfortunately, is clearly no. We have a missed cancer rate of two to almost 14% in Western populations. And I'm gonna show you that these numbers are uh, relatively stable across several studies. So such as this meta-analysis, you see 10 studies, almost 4,000 patients with 500 uh, GI cancers, upper GI cancers. You see 6% of the patients with GI cancer, advanced GI cancer, had one EGD one year before diagnosis, and uh, more than 10% had an EGD three years before diagnosis. This is valid, uh, this is valid also or this is valid both for esophageal and gastric cancer. And another paper, another systematic review, showing that almost 10% of the patients with uh, advanced gastric cancer had had a upper GI study, an EGD one, one year before the diagnosis of the, the cancer. So we can sweep the dirty below the carpet, such as doing Professor Jung, or we can improve our endoscopic technique. And we can improve our technique, this is very important, and we can improve our knowledge on how to detect this lesion. So let's talk about the technique. Preparation is key for a good endoscopic examination. In Japan, in, in most, most countries in Asia, they use a, a mix of pronase. The pronase is an enzyme to, to reduce the mucus by bicarbonate and stimeticone. In Brazil, we do not have pronase, so we mix, we add stimeticone with N-acetyl cysteine. So in N-acetyl cysteine, we reduce viscosity of gastric mucus, and there is some papers showing that it improves gastric mucosa visualization, and some papers showing that it doesn't improve. In my opinion, yes, it's valid to use. So usually, I offer the patient this mixture 20 minutes before the procedure, 100 cc of water with semeticone and n acetyl cysteine, 400 to uh, 1,000 milligrams, one gram. And this is what we expect. We see a lot of mucus and saliva in the stomach, and after you use this solution, you hope to find small lesions such as this one. There is also a scoring system to evaluate the quality of the endoscopic visualization of the gas chamber that use the, the amount of mucus and water and the location in the stomach. And you can give 
uh, it can give a score for the endoscopy, and usually you have less than seven, so it is a good, a good, a good endoscopy. So you have to avoid this situation, and usually you to 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 create a condition of an examination such as this one. Also, another way to improve endoscopic technique is to reduce peristalsis, and for this we use scopolamine. I use half of the ampule, it means 10 milligrams. In my opinion, it proved diagnostic accuracy and reduced inspection time. Adequate insufflation is also key for diagnosis, for a good diagnosis. Such as you see here, you see the angulus, maybe there is something here, the angulus again, but adequate insufflation, you see an early cancer in this patient. Another important, we talk about preparation, sedation for, for sure is very important, and antiperistaltic agent, but now we're gonna talk about systematic procedure. We should systematically uh, examine the whole esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. So uh, I invite you to read this paper from Professor Yao, published in 2013, about the 22 positions that you have to, 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 to view, to visualize, the stomach, right? And so by doing this, you are sure that you're gonna, you won't miss any part of the stomach. And there is also this very, very important paper from WEO group, task force group, uh, published in Digesting Endoscopy last year, also uh, describing a systematic way to examine the gastric chamber. So please read it, this is very important. And finally, to do a good examination, we need time, we need a certain amount of time dedicated to do a good examination. We know the time is money, but show, I can show you that, for example, in esophagus, in this paper, you have to spend more than one minute for every centimeter of Barrett. So if a patient has a 10 centimeter long Barrett, you need to spend 10 minutes watching and visualizing and examining this esophagus. By doing this, you improve the detection rate of suspicious lesions and the high grade dysplasia and carcinoma detection rate. And this is scientifically proven. The same has also been proven for detection of gas cancer. They compare the fast endoscopist versus the slow endoscopist. And the cutoff time is seven minutes. So if you are a slow endoscopist, you spend more than seven minutes in the endoscopic examination, you have a threefold increase in the detection rate of cancer and dysplasia. Once again, another paper, another paper comparing fast endoscopies with moderate and slow endoscopies. And now the cutoff is less than five minutes. You see that you increase the odds ratio of detecting, detecting early neoplasia if you, if you take more than five or seven minutes in an upper GI endoscopy. And here, guys, we're talking about spending one or two minutes more than the usual that usually you do. Another retrospective huge study with more than 100,000 screening EGDs showing that with a cut of three minutes to divide fast versus slow endoscopies, to show that is low endoscopies, endoscopies that spend more than three minutes in upper GIE increases the total neoplasm, dysplasia, early gastric, advanced gastric, and small lesion detection rates. So there is a, 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 a huge amount of evidence showing that you have to spend more than five minutes in upper GI, right? So this is a, a summary of, of, of this concept. It was published also by the World Endoscopy Organization Group. Uh, Professor Noria Uedo, Professor Ken Xiao, and a lot of other researchers showing that we should spend at least eight minutes in an upper GI endoscopy. So two minutes to reach the second part of the duodenum. And during this, you intubate the duodenum, you spend time cleaning using mucolytic, antispasmodic, etc. as I mentioned before. There are four minutes with the systematic protocol, the systematic visualization protocol to examine the stomach in a systematic way. And then you spend two minutes in the esophagus. And if the patient has Barrett's esophagus, at least one minute for every centimeter of Barrett's. And a special focus on three and six o'clock position in Barrett's esophagus because most of early neoplasia, high-grade dysplasia, they are located in this area. So uh, remember that 
our skills and our results are being more and more audited by these quality indicators. Right? Several, several societies are suggesting quality indicators to audit our skills, our results in endoscopy. And now I will talk about some characterization of cancer. So we, we have some tools to improve dysplasia and cancer detection. We have high definition endoscopy, chrome endoscopy, both uh, dichrome endoscopy, electronic chrome endoscopy, magnification, and more recently we have artificial intelligence that probably within a few years we're gonna be, will be part of our routine endoscopy and colonoscopy examination. Concerning Barrett's esophagus, high definition endoscopy is very important. There is also a Dutch study showing that expert endoscopies, endoscopies from expert centers for Barrett's esophagus has a much more uh, detection rate, high detection rate compared to community doctors. You see that the patients referred because of high grade dysplasia or cancer at random biopsy from community hospitals, when they are sent to experts, the experts detected a lesion in almost 80% of the cases. So this is very meaningful. So you use high definition, you use NBI and NBI you see these vessels, tortuous vessels, you see irregular surface and you do uh, detection of uh, high grade dysplasia or cancer. So there are papers, uh, systematic reviews showing that NBI has similar accuracy for dysplasia in early cancer detection, but with fewer biopsies. And some uh, papers showing that with NBI you have increased dysplasia and early cancer detection. So I think that now, High definition endoscopy and chrome endoscopy is key for Barrett's esophagus for, for detection of high grade dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. You can also use acetic acid, and this is very useful, but if you don't have it, no problem. Uh, you can use NBI or other electronic chrome endoscopy. But you have acetic acid, it's very useful. You see here in this case, you spray acetic acid, you wait some minutes. And you notice that in some area, the aceto whitening re the reaction is still present. Three minutes after you spray, it's still present in this area, but the aceto whitening reaction disappears in this area. So this redness is indi indicates that here maybe there is high grade dysplasia or cancer. So you should target this biopsy to this area where the aceto whitening reaction disappeared after three minutes of spraying, aceto, uh, uh, spraying acetic acid, as shown in this paper. So switching gears to esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, you have to be very attentive when you do endoscopy to find this, this uh, tiny redness area. Then you use electronic chrome endoscopy and see the vascularization is richer here, is brownish area. And then you spray Lugo and you have the pink color sign. This is very indicative of squamous scale center or dysplasia. And you see here a lot of examples of pink sign. So pink color sign, you spray Lugo, the normal epithelium is brown and the abnormal epithelium is Lugo void. But you, you wait two to three minutes and this uh, orange uh, color switch to pinkish color. And this is the pink color sign. The pink color sign is very specific for cancer. As you may see in this, this paper, is small sample size. You see that all the patients who had the positive color sign, they had cancer. But not all the patients with cancer had pink color sign. So the bottom line here is the presence of pink color sign is specific for high grade dysplasia or cancer. But if you don't find P color sign, it, it doesn't mean that this is not cancer, okay? Another endoscopic feature of early cancer is the presence of this whitish, uh, it seems almost uh, exudate, but it's not exudate. This is, is whitish pearl drops. This is also indicative of cancer. Once again, <clears throat> you apply NBI and then Lugo, you see a large flat, Early, uh, early squamous cell, cell cancer. And after Lugol, it's important to use an antidote, can be sodium hyposulfite 
for now vitamin C because lugol is alcoholic and the patient feels pain. So in order to avoid, avoid the pain, we use uh, antidotes such as sodium hypersulfite or vitamin C. So who should be screened? Should we apply screening for all the patients? So for example, for squamous cell cancer, we should select high risk groups. So the patients with alcohol and tobacco abuse, patients with hand and neck cancer, patients with alcoholic pancreatitis. For example, the incidence of squamous cell cancer in patients with high neck, head and neck squamous cell cancer is five from 12%. So in our center, we did the same. We did the lugol from endoscopy, NBI from endoscopy in patients with head and neck cancer. And in 130 patients, we found seven patients, sorry, 7% with squamous cell cancer. And <clears throat> most of them with in situ and intramucosal cancer. Also, achalasia is considered a, a, a high risk group for squamous cell cancer. And you see here, this paper from our group, 43 patients with achalasia, one case of cancer, 2%. You see this case was early, early cancer. At our institute, the Institute of Cancer, we have screened more than 2,000 patients with head and neck cancer. So the patients uh, are submitted to yearly upper GI endoscopy with NBI and Lugol. Okay, and we have found uh, esophageal squamous cell cancer in 5% of them. It means one in every 20 patients. And you see that unfortunately, if you, if you use only high definition white light endoscopy, you're gonna miss 40% of these lesions. So in order to detect early squamous cell cancer, you need to use NBI, uh, electronic chrome endoscopy and Lugo. It is necessary to detect. Concerning concerning the detection of early gastric cancer uh, in the stomach, there is another problem because the peptic action can, can produce uh, peptic erosions and sometimes it's difficult to differentiate uh, peptic erosion from cancer. So Professor Yao with magnification show, uh, taught us that you have to look for demarcation line with magnification as you see here, and you see here demarcation line and also to have to look for the surface, irregular or regular surface, and also vessel. Normal vessel, irregular vessel, absent vessel. So three features, three characteristics, demarcation line, the vessels, and the superficial aspect of the lesion. If you have two of them sus suspicious for cancer, then probably this is cancer. So for example, if you have the presence of the location line and ir uh, irregular surface cancer, if you have no demarcation line, but you have irregular vessels and irregular surface, this is probably a cancer. So T, two of the three features must be altered so you can tell this is cancer. This is ex uh, extensively explained in, in this paper by Professor uh, Kenshi Yao. So you see this is small erosion, you see demarcation line, irregular vessels, this is not peptic erosion, this is a minute early gastric cancer. And now I'm gonna talk very quickly on organizing an uh, endoscopic sumocosal dissection program. First, you must have a detection and a staging uh, superficial GI cancer program. Then you must discuss all the detected cases in a, with a multidisciplinary group, with surgeons and with uh, oncologists and etc. And then you have to have the skills on ESD and you have to monitor the quality of your ESD to be sure that you are offering high quality ESD for these patients. So I showed you that you have a screening of early cancer in patients with head and neck squamous cell cancer, more than 2000 patients 5% of them with cancer. And the, the patients that we select for ESD are patients with flat or slightly depressed lesion, because you know that patients with flat and, and slightly depressed lesion, so the patients with M1 or M2 cancer. We stage these patients using magnification and the IPCL 
as uh, described by the Japanese Society for Esophageal Cancer, and we try to select the patient with B1 or B2 IPCL pattern because these patients, the lesions probably restricted to the superficial layer of the sumucosa, 200 microns. B3 means deep, that's a massive invasion of sumucosa. So this is the indication, 2B to C lesions with B1, B2 IPCL, IPCL pattern. For the patients where we, we don't see clearly the IPCL, we use also EUS. So let me show this case, a depressed lesion with a lot of exudate, positive for NBI, brownish area compared to the normal mucosa. You see here the logo, and you see here the pink color sign, all characteristic of uh, early cancer. And you see we did uh, US because the lesion was too depressed, almost ulcerated. We were concerned about deep invasion of the sumucosa. And you see that the lesion is restricted, at least restricted to the sumucosa. You see that the muscular scrotia is normal here. And the IPCL B2 vessels, as you may see here, B1 and B2 vessels, no B3 vessels. So we perform an ESD in this patient. This is the specimen, all the cancer is here. And you see that the lesion was, was well, well differentiated. It's normal cell cancer restricted to the muscularis mucosa with no angiolymphatic or perineural invasion with free lateral and deep margins. And as I mentioned before, you must track the results of your ESD program. So I'm showing you the beginning of the SED program at our center, showing we, 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 we look for the percentage of resecting, the second circumference, procedure time, tumor size, and the histology invasion depth, unblocked resection rate, curative resection rate. So unblocked resection rate should be around 100%, a curative resection rate should be around 80, 85%. So this is good quality, uh, ESD problem. This is very important. So in conclusion, detection of early upper GI cancer is key for a good outcome for the patient. And to have a good detection rate, you must have adequate preparation, spend adequate time in the endoscopy, during the endoscopy, use chrome endoscopy, NBI or equivalent for Barrett's esophagus. Acetic acid may be used for Barrett's esophagus, NBI or equivalent and blue ball, they are absolutely necessary for the detection of this common cell cancer. Remember that if you use white light endoscopy, you're gonna miss almost 50% of all early squamous cell cancer. For gastric adenocarcinoma, NBI or equivalent and magnification is important for differentiation between fat erosion versus cancer. And concerning the treatment of early upper GI cancer, you must have a screening surveillance program. All the lesions and all the patients must be discussed in the multidisciplinary team. Accurate staging is key, and you must track your results and be sure that you are offering your patient high quality SCD. So I finished my presentation. Thank you. I expect to receive a lot of questions, and I take this moment to invite you to visit our center at São Paulo, the Institute of Cancer of the University of São Paulo. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Faudi, for this very nice uh, lecture demonstrating how to diagnose early breast cancer, which we miss in Egypt, how to treat. And now we have a group doing ECD, and I think this time that we search for early gastric cancer to be able to manage those patients before they go into complications. Uh, discussion will be at the end of second lecture. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker, my colleague and friend, Professor Anna Nosri, Professor of Pathology Gastroenterology, Department of uh, Endemic Diseases, Faculty of Medicine, Cairo University. His lecture will cover management of peptic ulcer bleeding. Uh, now, Thank Professor Anna Nosri. Uh, thank you, Professor Mazin, for the introduction. Thank you, uh, Astra and uh, uh, Roya, for organizing this uh, training uh, program. 
And uh, this is the agenda, we'll give an introduction about peptic ulcer bleeding, then the resuscitation, the risk stratification, endoscopy and endoscopic therapy, then pharmacologic therapy, management of refractory bleeding, follow-up and prevention of re-bleeding, and primary prevention of uh, peptic ulcer bleeding. Of course, I'll be giving sh some uh, short resumes about everything because this is a big, quite a big subject. So what is peptic ulcer? Peptic ulcer is a deep and sharply demarcated break in the lining of the mucosa of the uh, stomach or duodenum. When it is in the stomach, it's a gastric ulcer. When it's in the duodenum, it's a duodenal ulcer. A peptic ulcer forms when normal defense and repair mechanisms break down and the mucous membrane of the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum is damaged by the action of gastric acid. The, no, the two major causes of peptic ulcers are infection with Helicobacter pylori and the use of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, or low-dose uh, aspirin. Although less common than H. pylori and NSAIDs, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is another cause of peptic ulcers. The gastrin producing tumor causes excessive gastric secretion leading to uh, ulcers of the upper GI uh, tract. So peptic ulcer disease has the potential to develop into life-threatening complications such as perforation or bleeding. Peptic ulcer Bleeding is the most common cause of gastrointestinal bleeding, responsible for about 50% uh, of all the cases of, GI, of uh, upper gastrointestinal uh, bleeding. So this is the magnitude of the problem. The incidence of peptic ulcer bleeding is uh, around 19.4 to 79 cases per 100,000 individuals per year in Europe. The mortality is on average 30-day mortality of 8.7%. The recurrence of bleeding is up to 31%. 90% uh, of the re-bleeds occur in the first seven days. And of course, this problem entails quite a cost, whether in the management or later on the uh, cost of the morbidity of the patient. There is no significant decline in the incidence of peptic ulcer bleeding, despite the reduction in peptic ulcer uh, disease. So whether this is due to the increased use of uh, low-dose aspirin, the increased use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, in the current years. Uh, look at the incidence, the age-adjusted incidence rate per 100,000 individuals, the duodenal ulcer bleeding, the light bars, uh, the years 19, 19, 1993 to 1994, and the dark bars, the year 2000, and look at the uh, age-adjusted incidence for duodenal and gastric ulcer bleeding, no significant uh, difference, in spite of the reduction of the prevalence of peptic ulcer disease. So how does peptic ulcer bleeding present? It can present in five ways. Hematemesis, vomiting of blood, whether red blood or coffee ground, digested blood. Melina, black, tarry, foul smelling stools, hematochesia, a passage of bright red or maroon blood from the rectum. And uh, this creates sometimes a problem when you have a patient with massive bleeding per rectum and you don't know if it's uh, bleeding from the colon or from the small intestine or maybe the upper GI with the rapid transit of blood due to the massive bleeding. And there is uh, a study showing that if the uh, heart rate is greater than the systolic uh, blood pressure, then suspect upper GI bleeding in this uh, patient with bleeding uh, per rectum. The patient who has bleeding per rectum due to upper GI bleeding is always hemodynamically uh, unstable due to the massive bleeding. 
Don't forget that the peptic ulcer bleeding may present by occult bleeding that is not seen by the patient. This is identified uh, by special examination of the stools for fecal occult blood, whether using the guaiac testing for the blood or immunologic testing for the hemoglobin. So these tests will indicate that this patient has GI bleeding, which is not visualized by the patient. Symptoms of blood loss or anemia, like lightheadedness, syncope, or angina, or maybe dyspnea, and the pallor seen during examination of the patient will always point that the patient is anemic and will warrant a search for the cause of the anemia that may show uh, occult GI bleeding. So one of the very important items of managing the patient with peptic ulcer bleeding is resuscitation. So you have to restore the circulating volume to keep the patient hemodynamically stable through the infusion of crystalloids and blood transfusion if needed. You have to correct the coagulopathy if present. So if you have a, a low platelet count, you have to correct it. If you have a, a high INR, uh, you have to give vitamin K or maybe fresh rosy plasma. You have to correct a coagulopathy that is present in the patient, if present. Conservative blood transfusion uh, strategies should be adopted. You have to target a hemoglobin of uh, seven to, uh, to nine grams. You don't need to uh, insist on raising the hemoglobin to 10 and 11 grams and 12 grams like some physicians would do. Seven to nine grams is okay. The risk stratification is another important point in patients with peptic ulcer bleeding. These are the principal risk scores used in acute upper GI uh, bleeding. The most important are the Glasgow uh, Blatchford uh, scoring system and the abbreviated Glasgow Blatchford scoring system, which is uh, even simpler using less parameters, the urea, the hemoglobin, the blood pressure, and the pulse. And the Rockwell store, uh, score and the full Rockwell score that includes the endoscopic uh, findings. So these risk assessment scores are very important to decide whether the patient is going to need hospitalization. You can save a lot of costs if you find that the patient has a low risk uh, score, so you don't need to admit him uh, to hospital or you even shorten the duration of admission to hospital. The Glasgow Platform score will identify low risk cases for ambulatory management. The AIMS 65 and the PNED scores are more accurate at predicting mortality than the Rocco store score. So these scores are very useful to decide the uh, way you are going to manage the patient and whether you need uh, aggressive management and hospitalization uh, and maybe hospitalization uh, and ICU admission for the patient. Endoscopy is one of the cornerstones of management of peptic ulcer uh, bleeding. Endoscopy has to be done within uh, 24 hours uh, in order to increase the likelihood of identifying the source of bleeding. And the success of endoscopic techniques depends on identification of the source uh, of bleeding. Because when you go in with the endoscope, you might find more than one potential source for bleeding. So identification of the source of bleeding, the actual source of bleeding is very important in the management uh, and decreases 
the risk of uh, re-bleeding. So the importance of endoscopy is to confirm the diagnosis, locate the site of bleeding, allow estimation of the rate of recurrent bleeding, as we will see with the scores now, endoscopic scores, and enables various therapeutic options as we will see uh, now in a, few, in a few slides. So what happens usually when a patient presents with peptic ulcer bleeding is that the uh, attending physicians are so, so busy at arranging for endoscopy they, that they don't do proper resuscitation of the patient. Please don't forget that the most important part of the management of the patient is resuscitation. And think of endoscopy later. You can do endoscopy within 24 hours. You don't need to rush to do endoscopy in four hours and six hours. So please resuscitate the patient first. This is the first classification of bleeding peptic ulcers. Endoscopic findings can give valuable information about the risk of re-bleeding after hospital admission. Endoscopic signs indicating risk of re-bleeding were classified in 1974 by Forrest et al. Now, the classification is Forrest 1A, spurting hemorrhage. Forrest 1B, oozing hemorrhage. Forrest 2A, non-bleeding visible vessel. Forrest 2B, adherent clot. Forest to see a flat pigmented spot, and forest three a clean ulcer base. And this is the risk of rebleeding by forest grade. For forest one, it's fifty five percent. But I'd like to elaborate on this fifty five percent. Fifty five percent nowadays is for forest one a. Forest one b. The studies show that the risk of re-bleeding is not high. So with forest 1B, which is oozing of blood only, not spurting of blood, the risk of re-bleeding is not 55%. It's only around 20%. For forest 2A, it's 43%. Forest 2B, 22%. Forest 2C, it's 10%, and forest 3, it's only 5%. Uh, so the appearance of the ulcer during endoscopy will give you an idea about the risk of uh, re-bleeding. Through the endoscopy, you can do several techniques to stop the bleeding. You can inject epinephrine, diluted epinephrine. You can use the a bipolar heater probe to stop the bleeding. You can apply a hemoclip to stop the bleeder. Usually, you have to do dual uh, techniques. You have to do two techniques, a combination of epinephrine, epinephrine injection plus thermal treatment or hemoclips. The guidelines indicate that this is better in controlling bleeding, first you inject diluted epinephrine. This clears uh, the field, and then you apply the other technique, which is either thermal, and it can be uh, with the heat probe or the thermal uh, treatment with the heat probe, or you can even apply argon plasma coagulation to the bleeder, or you can apply the hemoclips. You, got, you have also other options for uh, big ulcers or ulcers with a fibrosed base. You have the bigger over the scope uh, clips, which can, which have wider uh, angles and can hold or close bigger ulcers and can even uh, compress the bleeder if there is fibrosis. You have the hemostatic. Uh, powders, I'm going to talk about them in a few seconds. And you have another uh, very useful technique, not used widely, but a very useful technique, the Doppler assessment of bleeding and guided thermal coagulation. So you have a Doppler probe that passes through the channel of the scope. 
you can detect the artery at the base of the ulcer and you can guide the thermal uh, coagulation to this artery. So quite a useful technique. The hemostatic uh, powders, these powders are sprayed over the uh, area that is bleeding. They polymerize for like a coat. This coat will stop the bleeding. Uh, it will also increase the concentration of coagulation factors in the area of the bleeding. So these are quite handy, not as a first technique to uh, apply in the bleeding, but very handy when you cannot stop the bleeding after applying, for example, the hemoclips. So it would be very practical to apply them, stop the bleeding and maybe go for a second look later uh, and try to apply another clip or another modality to stop uh, the bleeding. If you apply hemostatic powder alone, then you are going to get a risk of re-bleeding. It has to be uh, aided by another either thermal or mechanical uh, closure of the vessel. What about pharmacological therapy? Uh, before endoscopy, half an hour before endoscopy, you can give IV uh, erythromycin, a dose of five milligrams per kilogram over uh, five to 30 minutes. This prokinetic will uh, clear the field and will help proper visualization of the bleeder. Uh, PPI is very important in the management of peptic ulcer bleeding. PPI is given IV for 72 hours. And if the patient has a high risk of re-bleeding, then this is followed by 11 days of high dose uh, oral uh, omeprazole, 40 milligrams twice daily. If, it, if the patient has a low risk of lead bleeding, you go for a standard dose of PPI, azomeprazole, 40 milligrams once uh, daily. You need the PPI because you need the pH more than six to maintain platelet uh, aggregation. And this will help stop the bleeding from the ulcer. So PPIs are very important in the management of uh, peptic ulcer uh, bleeding. And the guidelines use suggest high dose PPI, isomoprazole 80 plus eight regimen, which is 80 milligram IV injection for 30 minutes, followed by eight milligrams per hour continuous IV drip for uh, 72.5 hours, which is a total of 72 hours IV, high dose IV PPI. And this is a randomized double blind parallel group study of 767 uh, patients randomized to receive isomeprazole IV 80 milligrams bolus for 30 minutes followed by isomeprazole IV 8 milligrams per hour for 71.5 hours, a total of 72 hours versus another group of placebo and this is followed by oral treatment with isomoprazole 40 milligrams once daily for 27 days. Look at the primary endpoint, which is re-bleeding rate within 72 hours, a 43% uh, reduction of the risk of re-bleeding in patients who re received the high dose uh, isomoprazole. And the reduction of bleeding is sustained for up to seven and 30 days. Again, 44% risk reduction within seven days and 43% risk reduction within uh, 30 days in the group that received uh, IV uh, isomoprazole, high dose IV isomoprazole, followed by oral uh, isomoprazole. 
when the intragastric pH uh, was compared with high dose, different forms of high dose IV PPI therapy, you'll find that esomeprazole achieved the longest time of pH more than six, 52% of the time of the 24 hours compared to pantoprazole 23 to 28% of time and lenzoprazole 39% of the 24 hours. So isoprazole achieves a longer duration of a pH more than uh, six. If the patient gets re-bleeding, if the center is good, uh, properly equipped and has experience endoscopy, then you do repeat endoscopy. If not, you have to refer to the patient to a center with more experience in management of GI bleeding. Uh, if the center is experienced and the uh, endoscopist fails to stop the second lead, then you have to resort to interventional radiology. The radiologist will go in the artery feeding the ulcer and will embolize it, closing the bleeding or stopping the bleeding. Or you may resort to surgery if you don't have an interventional uh, radiologist. Follow up and prevention of uh, re, uh, re bleeding. Don't forget that you have to continue PPI therapy in patients at risk. For example, patients that will continue on aspirin, low dose aspirin, or patients that will continue on anticoagulation or non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Don't forget to test for H. pylori and treat and confirm eradication of H. pylori, because if you don't do that, then you will get recurrence of ulcer and recurrence of bleeding. You have to compensate for the blood loss. You have to give iron for the anemia. The early in, uh, reintroduction of anti-thrombotics uh, uh, or anti-inflammatory uh, drugs has to be very judicious. It has to be uh, decided by a communication between the gastroenterologist and the cardiologist and the rheumatologist. If non-steroidals are required, uh, silicoxid is relatively safe. Uh, another important entity is the uh, idiopathic ulcers, peptic ulcer, uh, which in, in patients who do not receive non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and who don't have H. pylori infections, these ulcers have a higher risk of re-bleeding and higher risk of mortality and usually occur in elderly uh, people and may have uh, maybe an ischemic background. The last point I'm going to tackle is, can we prevent the formation of the ulcer and bleeding from the ulcer? Yes, theoretically we can. This is the primary prevention. Patients on long-term aspirin or non-SAIDs should be tested and treated for H. pylori, and this is in the guidelines now. This will decrease the uh, peptic ulcer bleeding in these patients, primary prevention. And please do not forget to confirm eradication of H. pylori. Patients on long-term antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation or NSAIDs, consider long-term PPI if these patients are at high risk of bleeding, especially patients who are 75 years older or have a history of peptic ulcer or patients using selective serotonin reuptake uh, inhibitors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Aminussi. And now we go to discussion and questions. Uh, first, I have uh, some questions to Professor Fauzi. There was a paper discussing that there is a difference between European and Asian as regard early gastric cancer. And then one Japanese endoscopist went to England and 
during endoscopy, he showed them that uh, a lot of lesions were missed during the endoscopy by the Europeans. Do you think that this is true, that the incidence is the same in both European and Asian? The only the identification of the lesion is less in European and other societies? Yes. So thank you for the question. Uh, very good question. And I think that the, this article that is, is mentioned, uh, that you mentioned, uh, underlines the fact that if you have a good quality examination, you increase your capacity to detect uh, early lesions. So I think that this is main different. This is this, sorry. This is main difference from uh, Eastern and Western centers. So in Eastern centers, they have a systematic way to do upper GI endoscopy, and they prepare the patient and, uh, and they prepare the patient in a systematic way. So they increase the the the, the they increase. The, the, the capacity of detection of early lesions. So I think that we have to uh, to change our way to do endoscopy and uh, pay more attention, spend more time, prepare the patient in an adequate way, uh, use good scopes and use good technique to detect early cancer. I, I have a question yeah. uh, to Dr. Fauzi. Uh, now, uh, not every center, well, I'm, talk, I'm talking about Egypt, not every uh, center in Egypt is equipped uh, to see all these changes, early changes that can diagnose early cancer. So how can, what, what's your advice to the uh, junior gastroenterologists who are practicing in places that don't have the, these high definition scopes, that don't have the facility for chromo endoscopy. So what should be the way they do the endoscopy and how can they increase their suspicion of early lesions using the standard scopes? Thank you for the question. Very good question, Dr. Osby. Uh, so, if you do not have access to high definition endoscopy, electronic chrome endoscopy, you have to spend more time in your examination. You have to watch all the mucus and all the secretions and all the exudate over the lesions. And you have to keep a high suspicion ray, a high suspicious uh, eye for, for the lesions. So uh, you know that the cancer have the, the cancer cells, they have a, a different adherence compared to normal cells. So it's not, uh, it's not by chance, it's not by chance that the mucus or the exudate is adhered, is uh, glued in the, in the cancer because the cancer has a different adherence capacity. So if you, some, if you see some exudate or mucus, you have to wash. You wash with a syringe, with, with water, with saline, and you're gonna remove the mucus and maybe there is a cancer over there. So this is a, a point. And if you, you, if you see small changes, subtle changes in the mucosa, redness, depression, uh, elevation. So you have to go there. And if you don't have NVI, you don't have a high definition, at least you have the common dyes. You, I think that you have access to indigo carmine and you have access to Lugo. I think that they're, they're, they're cheap and they are available. So if you don't have high definition endoscopy, you don't have any VI, eye scan, VLI, at least you have indigo carmine. So you say you are in the stomach and you see a slight elevation, a slight depression, an area of friability, irregularity. So you wash and then you put 0.4% indigo carmine solution. And you're gonna see better this lesion. You are in the esophagus and the patient is high risk for cancer. The patient is alcohol in Egypt, I don't believe, but maybe tobacco abuse uh, is tobacco abuse, or the patient had a head and neck cancer. So even if you don't see anything, you should do systematically lugol chrome endoscopy in this patient. This is 
your chance to detect a small, flat, early uh, squamous cell cancer. And to do all this, you need time. You need time to do this endoscopy. You need at least 10 minutes to do this endoscopy. So allocate a correct amount of time to do both quality endoscopy. If you allocate just three minutes to do endoscopy and you don't have a good equipment, probably you, you won't be able to do good diagnosis. There's a question from Zant uh, D about when to call ECD as a failure. Okay, so I think that there are two kinds of failures in ECD. One is technical. So you cannot finish the SED because there was a perforation, because there was a bleeding that you couldn't manage, because the lesion was invading deeper in the wall, deeper than you expected. So this is technical failure, okay? Aside the technical failure, there are, uh, there are curability criteria. So you remove the lesion, and you know that the criteria that tells that the lesion was cured or not. For example, for gas cancer, well differentiated adenocarcinoma restricted to SM1, 500 microns, lateral and deep margins, they're free of cancer, no angiolymphatic invasion. So, so this is, the lesion is considered cured. If you have angiolymphatic invasion, so it doesn't meet the criteria of cure. This is not failure, right? But it's the, 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 the resection was not curative, right? So, and now you discuss with the patient and you discuss with the multidisciplinary group if the patient should be sent to surgery, to further treatment, or if the patient is gonna be just a clinically followed. So, uh, so I think that these two, two differences in, in failure. Uh, second, uh, if we have non-lifting sign, we stop EMR, or we don't stop EMR. But if there is non-lifting, do you do ECD or also contraindication? Okay. So uh, when you do EMR, you have no lifting sign. It's impossible to do EMR. And I think that ESCD has this advantage. If you have a non-lifting sign, many times the non-lifting sign is caused by fibrosis, not caused by cancer. And with ESCD, you can resect, you can perform unblocked resection, even when you have fibrosis, even when you have non-lifting sign. So, for example, you have a depressed lesion in the colon. You know that these, these LSCTs, these depressed 2C LSCTs in the colon, they usually have huge fibrosis. It's very difficult if you inject. You're going to see that the center will not elevate. So this lesion, you can remove it with the SED. The same for stomach. In the stomach, you have uh, uh, ulcerated cancer and you give PPI. There is revitalization of the ulcer, but still there is a scar. The scar is not a contraindication for the SED because you can remove unblocked resection with the SED even with the scar. So this is the main, the main advantage of the SED in my point of view. The risk of perforation in the right side of the colon is higher than the left side of the colon. So if you find the lesion in the right side of the colon, you start with EMR or you go directly to ECD? That's a very good question. All very good questions. Thank you. So another very good one. So I think that it depends on our skills. So my personal bias. First, you need a good diagnosis of the lesion. So you do chrome endoscopy and you do magnification. With NBI and magnification, you see the vessels pattern and when, with indigo carmine, you see the pit pattern, uh, the pit pattern. With the pit pattern and the vessels, you can predict if the lesion has invasion of the submucosa or not. If you see a lesion with high risk of submucosa invasion, Unfortunately, the only way to remove it is doing ESD, okay? But let's suppose that you did a good diagnosis, NPI, indigo carmine, pitch pattern, and the lesion is four, uh, is, is four pit, uh, the, pit pattern, the pit pattern is four, and the vessels is uh, JNET 2A, so probably the lesion is restricted to the mucosa. You are in the right column. 
So you can do EMR, even piecemeal EMR will do the job. And so if you feel more comfortable to, the, to do piecemeal EMR, because you know that the risk of perforation will be lower compared to SCD, go ahead, do piecemeal EMR. So for piecemeal EMR, the results will be equivalent to ESD in terms of in terms of curability because you are dealing with adenoma in the stomach and esophagus you are not dealing with adenoma you are dealing we are dealing with carcinoma so this is different in the colon you are usually dealing with adenoma so you have a large adenoma intermucosal adenoma in the right colon usually i do piecemeal emr because i know that the risk of perforation in scd is, is larger so what if you resect a, a, a lesion in the right colon uh, and then uh, piecemeal by EMR and then you find in the pathology uh, cancer cells? What would be the uh, action then? That, that's a difficult one, uh, Dr. Oswin, because it means that the, the, the initial diagnosis was not correct. So when you do the pit pattern, when you did the pit pattern, when you did the NBI with the magnification, you underestimated, you underestimated the invasion of this lesion. And now you have a huge problem. So it depends on what the pathologist will tell you. For example, the pathologist tell you, tells you that in, uh, there is a, a small part of cancer uh, invading the lateral margin of the lesion. Well, the lateral margin may be we could follow this patient. But let's suppose that the pathologist tells you, let's see a lot of, a lot of malignant cells in the submucosa in different fragments. So maybe this patient should be sent to surgery because you're, you're not, you, you never know about the real staging of this patient. Okay. So this is the main problem. You have piecemeal EMR, you do not have the correct staging. But on the other way, the pathologist tells you, that he saw just a small, tiny area of cancer in the lateral margin of EMR. So maybe we should go back and take biopsies and et cetera and follow this patient. But I think that in this situation, you should pay for surgery for most of the cases. Thank you, Professor Fauzi and Professor Ayman for the lectures and for the discussion. And now it's time now to go to the hands-on training. And now, uh, as we know, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding is one of the most important emergencies in the endoscopy field that we can save a lot of lives if we do it in time. And uh, uh, this needs a skillful endoscopist, good accessories, a trained nurses. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ahmed Tumbari from Mansoura University, Dr. Hassan Ghanim from Benchwave University, who will do the hands-on training, how to manage GI bleeding. Amazing. Thank you. To measure, and I would like to measure Haksamani. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mazen. Uh, thank you for all the panel. I would also like to thank uh, Ro'ya, uh, Dr. Mustafa Brahim and Dr. Brahim Mustafa for allowing uh, us this uh, marvelous chance. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, uh, side by side with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Ahmed Tumbari from Mansoura. Thank you, Dr. Hussein. And we're going to demonstrate the various techniques of uh, hemostasis in cases of active GI bleeding. And uh, we'll go straight to the first case. So can we have a bleeding point? Zero. Yes, uh, okay, we will demonstrate uh, different techniques today for upper GI bleeding. Uh, we will demonstrate uh, endoclips. We can also demonstrate uh, argon plasma coagulation, uh, also band ligation for viruses, and finally, uh, hemospray for uh, massive bleeding or as a temporary mechanism. Uh, we will start uh, the first case with bleeding ulcer or bleeding vessel, uh, demonstrating uh, endoclips or hemoclips. Uh, so we can start bleeding if you can see the endoscopic picture. Okay, we can imagine that this case of bleeding uh, ulcer with visible blood vessel or actively bleeding vessel, which means uh, forest uh, A classification, forest 1A classification. Uh, so uh, we, we, we have about forest classification, Dr. Ahmed. 
we, we don't yes. have the airscope view. Uh, is it is it one year now? Michelle, if the hands on Michelle, if it's true. Now it's okay. Yes, okay. now it's okay. okay. So uh, I'm working. talking about the forest classification you just okay. mentioned. I think it's a very important point. We have to know uh, the, uh, the the forest classification. Okay, okay, okay. Because it, uh, it's part of the decision making. The forest classification part of the Rockall scoring system and uh, other scoring systems uh, for risk uh, assessment and risk uh, evaluation that's very important because this can be part of our decision making about the techniques to do or even when not to do any technique and just medical treatment may be enough so dr ahmed uh, uh, very nicely mentioned the forest classification in this case which probably will necessitate a combination therapy yes we are talking about the uh, forest uh, uh, one A or B, which means spurting or bleeding uh, vessel, or oozing vessel. Uh, so we are using combination therapy either by injection associated with mechanical or thermal uh, uh, assistance, either using argon or hemoclip. So uh, uh, in this case, you'll be using the clips after the injection. Yes, we start by injections then clips. Uh, okay, so so Doctor Asam will demonstrate two different yes, types have, of clips we before have starting. Two different clips to choose from. Sometimes more in real life. But we have, of course, the Cook uh, clip and the Boston Resolution uh, clip. Okay, um, we use both interchangeably, and I don't see a big difference between either. Uh, some endoscopists will have their personal preferences, of course. The Resolution clip comes in larger sizes, like 16, but the, uh, uh, sorry, the Cook clip comes in larger sizes, whereas the Boston uh, clip uh, comes in smaller sizes, uh, except this new Boston 360. And uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, how would you choose your clip? Uh, okay, we can choose uh, clips depending on many issues. Uh, uh, the first, the Boston and Coke clips have the advantage of reopening several times. Uh, but we have uh, different size of the blade itself and different size of the body of the clip itself. For, uh, yes, this one, for uh, for the Coke, we, it's rotatory clip as uh, we can rotate the clip by rotating the handle itself. After opening, like this, you can rotate the person open. Open yes. and rotate. Open and rotate. Yes. yes. And you can rotate Perfect. the clip by the handle, like Rania is doing. So the clip itself is rotating. Is it clear? Uh, there's a question. So we had a question. Uh, when Dr. Yes, Dr. Mazen was uh, giving the lecture. He was saying that uh, spurting has high incidence bleeding than oozing. But in my opinion, these yes. are different phases. I don't know if you have the same opinion like me or what is written. Uh, both are classified as forest A classification, which are considered risky patients. So it should be managed usually by double technique, either by injection associated with thermal or mechanical. Uh, 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 we return again to the advantage of this clip. We have the body of the clip itself and the opening blade, the opening width. The opening width for Coke, we have 11 and 16 millimeter, which is different from other companies, which also only have 11 millimeters. The second one, our second way to choose the type of the clip is the length of the body itself of the clip. For Coke and Boston, both have uh, nearly the same size of the body, but other companies like Microtech have shorter shorter body of the clip, which is more suitable to use in narrow space, like using it in the esophagus. The long body make it difficult in narrow spaces like esophagus to use this clip. But the advantage is reopening more than one time and the rotation of the clip itself, which make it easier for the application of the clip itself. And this as is the same in Boston and uh, Yes, it's and the same. Coke. Yes, okay. okay we will, we will so close. you can so, demonstrate? Uh, yes, we uh, can demonstrate on real case. We can start by injection. I'm using Fuji scope and I'm assisted today with Rania. We will start by injection needle. What do you prefer to inject before uh, starting uh, uh, application of the clip for the bleeding visit? You prefer saline alone or with adrenaline? And at what concentration you prefer? Uh, I'm not a big, uh, great believer in adrenaline, actually, especially if we know that the effect we desire from injection is the tamponade effect, yes. not the vasoconstrictor effect of adrenaline. Sometimes we even have solutions of like glycol solutions with no adrenaline 
uh, they can stay longer than saline. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not a big fan of adrenaline. I can inject only saline just to lift and to tamponade the lesion. But do you think that uh, immediate vasoconstriction effect can help in reducing bleeding and localizing the bleeding Maybe site? can help in better visualization. Yes. It's, uh, adrenaline is more relaxing for the doctor. Yes. I don't think it uh, makes any difference for the patient. So we have this bleeding we have this bleeding ulcer. If we inject, we, we prefer usually to inject uh, saline over adrenaline alone or saline alone. We inject four quadrants, all sides of the bleeding vessel itself to make tamponade effect and vasoconstriction all aside. We can have the uh, tip of the needle run here, please. Need it out. Yes. We can start by injection, it's, it's injecting a small amount. We have two injection techniques, inject run here. We can inject by, after insertion, we can withdraw till we see the left, like we see now, which means we are injecting submucosal or stop runner. We can see the right elevation, or we can have different technique of injection by starting to inject before entering the, uh, keep, keep the needle out. So we can start to inject, inject runner, before entering the submucosa till we see lifting. So we mean we are in the submucosal space, like this. Stop runner. Needle out. So now we can go for the clip application. Why to use the injection for the clips? We usually uh, in the forest one classification, either two, one A or one B, we prefer dual mechanism. Injection with thermal or injection with uh, a mechanical application. And also with adherent clots, so up to forest two A, two A and two B. Yes, two yes, two A also with visible vessel. It's sure to use double uh, mechanism yes, for first, yes. yes. Uh, for first to be, uh, it's questionable, but usually we prefer to remove the black cloth first and reassess the class of the visitor. Yes, my question is very important. Why to, inject, why to inject ferris? Uh, before the clipping? Yeah. Um, uh, because injection, I think, Open gives the advantage of. Uh, um, uh, decreasing the uh, the bleeding Which and uh, uh, making it better visualized for uh, applying the clip. Uh, you prefer to inject after the clip, Doctor Mazen? If there is a if there is a bleeding vessel, I prefer that, uh, squirting or oozing. I prefer clips first. But if there is an artery without bleeding, I prefer injection before the clips to avoid trauma by the edges of the clips and to induce bleeding. Okay. But uh, injecting after the clips, maybe we are worried about uh, displacing the clip a little bit. The, yes. If you catch uh, properly, you catch, it is uh, most, uh, difficult to displace. Okay. Okay. So Turahma can demonstrate the exact technique what you are doing. Uh, Yes, uh, the first, the first uh, trick is to localize the bleeding point or the management point at usually between uh, 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 4 and uh, 8 o'clock, which is the easiest place to control your scope. After localizing, as we see it's now about 6 o'clock, we have opened the clip and we can rotate it. If it's not appropriate, you can rotate Rania, demonstrating. More, 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 more. We have more rotation till we, till we have the appropriate rotation. More, more. You can see the clip rotation till I choose. Okay, that's enough. Till I choose the appropriate side, so I can now become nearer to the edge of the clip. I choose usually yeah, of the ulcer. Yes, usually I ha we have bleeding as we see. I should grip both sides of the lesion, so it's appropriate position now. I start by little bit section to make it easier to grip the bleeding vessel. Then I will ask my assistant to start to close slowly. Close, 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 close. We can see now it's slipped, so it's not appropriate to fire. So I will ask again to reopen. Reopen, Rania. And I will come closer to the edge of the lesion to, the, to grip both sides with more suction. And I will ask Rania to reclose again. So you're using your scope to push? Yes, or that, that, you're this, this is better now. No, it slipped again, so I will try again, reopen Rania. I think the stomach is over. Again, the process. Yes, I'm, I'm sucking air to make it easier to grip both edges. I'm sucking more air. You can close Rania. 
close, 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 close more. Yes, this is better now, and we can see both edges are closed. So I can ask here to fire at this position. Okay, reopen again, Rodney. Reopen. We can see the bleeding now. The bleeding point is controlled. We did dual mechanism injection and controlling with clip. You can fire if you wish. Okay. So we will now move to the other technique, which is argon plasma, which will be demonstrated by Dr. Hossam. You can come, Dr. Hossam. Thank you. Do you have any question regarding the clip? When to use our VESCO, Dr. Amin Lutzi was uh, saying that we can use our VESCO, but I think the VESCO needs three endoscopy to get out and to apply the clips, but when to use it? Yes, yes. As you mentioned, Professor Mazen, this is a disadvantage of a VESCO because you should come out with the scope and reapply the clip. We have different advantage for the OVESCO. The disadvantage is the OVESCO is a little bit expensive more than the normal clip, and you can go out with a scope, which means you can need more time with more bleeding, difficult to locate again the same bleeding point. But the advantage is we have greater diameter. You can only use clip with uh, uh, up to 1.5 centimeter or maybe 1.6 centimeter, but for the OVESCO, for larger diameter bleeding vessel or with vessels with hard uh, fibrosis around it, we have more gripping power. So it's better to control bleeding with obesco if we have hard lesion or more uh, more surface area, more than one and a half centimeter, it's better to use obesco. Right. But the disadvantage is coming out to the scope and you can lose the bleeding point. So the vision. What do you think? The yeah, vision. I agree very much. And, uh, the vision. The vision. Yeah, also difficult vision. It's like the vision, yes, like the vision with bend ligation. Difficult to visualize the bleeding point. Yes, it might be especially helpful in penetrating or suspiciously penetrating peptic ulcers. Yes. Okay, so we're uh, here now to demonstrate the uh, thermal uh, methods. We have the argon plasma. I want to say at this point that you have to be very familiar with your equipment that you're using uh, um, uh, and what uh, settings you are going to use because that's very important. Uh, we have here um, equipment. Bova. Bova. Yes, electrical yeah. unit Bova. Bova uh, from Germany. And its setting is quite different, actually, than uh, the one I'm used to. Uh, but we have to revise the settings and choose the proper setting for the area we are dealing with. In the stomach, it's different uh, than the uh, colon. Uh, the uh, right, left side of the colon is different from the right side, which is thinner. So uh, usually we use uh, uh, argon plasma coagulation in, in the stomach uh, wisely. Uh, in cases of ulcers like uh, here or like what we're going to demonstrate or in cases of larger areas of bleeding like the gave the gastro uh, the, the uh, or larger areas of bleeding it has the advantage of applying uh, argon plasma calculation to a larger surface area okay that means the catheter the argon mm -hmm. We can also use argon in, in different moods. We can use it either by controlling the power itself. We have different techniques, either spray uh, coagulation or we can have uh, a soft coagulation, not only depending on the what itself. Okay, so uh, I have to be in control of the scope and the uh, argon catheter that's why i wouldn't like it to be so far out i would like it to be quite close to the scope but not very close to avoid injury for uh, of the uh, of the endoscope itself and when i find the lesion i bring the lesion to a, a proper position like here for instance and we have uh, uh, two methods, either the contact method, if I let the catheter touch the mucosa, or the non-contact, which is when we have uh, ability of spraying argon, and this is, of course, uh, much more convenient. Yes, the uh, contact method, you mean for the heater probe? For the heater probe, it's yes. the contact, yes. of course, but for the argon, we, uh, we choose the uh, non-contact non -contact. Uh, spray. So you have to be, uh, uh, to get quite close to the lesion, and use your pedal. I'll get a little closer.
Yes, we can see here the spray. Yes, this is a coagulation, yes. Yes. You prefer to start around, around the bleeding point or the first touch is at the bleeding point? I prefer to start around. Around the bleeding point. Yes. And what, what do you think, Dr. Mezen? To start the bleeding point or around the bleeding point? Around the bleeding point, uh, not to uh, lose the vision if the bleeding increase. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is the effect where we are looking for actually. We have uh, another type of catheter that sprays the argon uh, sideways. The argon is uh, quite safe because the depth of penetration does not exceed four millimeters. So it's quite safe and uh, you can hardly get any perforations with argon plasma coagulation. But you prefer to decrease the current in the right side of the colon and duodenum, which have- Because yes, they are thinner. thinner wall, yes. yes, that's right. In the right side of the colon, that's very and, important. And to avoid touch in the right side of the colon. Definitely, yes. yes. And here, just to demonstrate uh, another, the other technique, which is like uh, spraying uh, larger areas, you, you have to do like lines like, like this, like Gabe. Okay. Okay. So you, you tend to sweep. Also, they are using recently hybrid hybrid technique now for Gabe by starting injection first before to elevate the submucosa and they could make it like a cushion. So we can increase the current up to the ablative syrup, up the ablative current up to 80 or 90 watts. Then we can do ablation after elevation of the cushion, which is called hybrid technique for give. Recently, yes. did it right, Dr. Hassan? Yes, it's yes, very convenient. And uh, what we are looking for is this white bed, not, mm -hmm. the, not the very dark bed, not to burn the mucosa, but just to coagulate. Okay. Uh, I think we can move to the next to the uh, band, technique. Band ligation, okay. Okay. We can now demonstrate uh, uh, the third technique for bleeding, which is mainly for the bleeding varicet, which is band ligation. We can use it also uh, for uh, uh, bleeding vessels like the foil lesion. You can use, because if it's small and clear to see the vessel, you can use band ligation instead of clips. So we can go with the scope out to show how to apply the band. Uh, uh, we are using a uh, Koch medical band. We have, uh, can you demonstrate, uh, Dr. Hassam, the, uh, the parts of the band like it? Yes, this is the, uh, the handle, the rotating handle, and, sorry, which we mount on the- Yes, we can put the rotating handle- On first. the working channel. Yeah, it have two directions. Either you can do it in both directions. Yeah. Can you see my hand? In both one direction like this, by pushing inside, it's moving in one direction, no coming back. But by moving like this, you can rotate in both directions. So we will start like this. Yes. And Just we will insert the introducer. We have here small tip to attach the thread of the band itself. We will insert it through the scope. Can you give me the band itself? It can be used also on give. Yes. It can be used in GAVE, multiple yes. band ligation. Yes. yes. Do you prefer it over argon, Dr. Mazen, for GAVE? Or leave no. it as a, a backup therapy for patients not uh, uh, not giving good results with uh, argon? I prefer argon usually. Oh. Because uh, it's easy to yes. argon. Large, large surface area. Okay, so the next step before the knot of the thread itself, you, Rania will apply it. To the hook here? Yes, to the hook coming out of the introducer. And I will pull the introducer through the scope. Till we come out from the other side. Now we can, we can fix the band over the tip of the scope itself. And the thread like here in the channel of the handle of the uh, band uh, device. So we rotate till we have full grip. Now I will push the handle inside to be in one direction, which is firing direction, no coming back like this. It's now in one direction only. And we have to check the position. Yes, we have to check the position. It should be between four and eight o'clock for better visualization with the threads. Yes.
now we will start bending. We imagine that we have uh, bleeding esophageal viruses. For bleeding esophageal viruses, it's, uh, uh, we start, you prefer to start at the uh, gastroesophageal junction to control the upcoming vessel, which is upstream. What yes. do you think, Dr. Hussam? Yes, I tend to start very low. Yes, we start very low up here. We start suction. This is animal model, so a little bit, the tissue is a little bit stiff, but we should continue uh, suction till we see the red out. Red out means the mucosa come in contact with the scope itself. So, but this is a little yes, bit. Yes, you don't see the uh, red out, so I will try another press. Yes, it should be, because animal model is a little bit harder mm. or stiff to see the red out, so it's difficult to suck. Mm. But we will continue sucking. The all-time question really is, do we band below the Z-line or not? Uh, uh, in my experience and uh, uh, from the Bovino consensus, yes, we can uh, band the gastroesophageal uh, um, extensions below the Z-line, but not the isolated gastric viruses. This one Dr. Mazin, what's your experience? Slip, slip because it's hard one. Yes, what do you think, Dr. Mazin? I think... Banding uh, below the Z-line. I think uh, it's the same like steroid Before uh, histoacryl, we were injecting the blood zero line if the branch and varix because it is small and can be The same for band ligation, but it is useless for gastric viruses, actual gastric viruses. It is for what we call an isolation yes. one, but actually, yes. I don't believe in saline classification. Okay. We will try in another place, which little bit not hard or stiff. I usually so we can see the red scope if the tissue is hard. I rotate the yes, I'm, I'm, try, I'm, 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 try, I'm trying to do this. Yes, he's but trying. I also I can see the red out. The tissue is a little bit stiff, so I don't have enough gripping for bending. But we will try again because, of course, this is an animal, animal model and yes. the elasticity is different from human, but it will be so much easier with the, with the viruses, which will be soft and easy sucked inside the scope. I'm trying to rotate the scope a little bit right and left while continuing suction, so I can see that it out. It's not really enough for finding now, but I will try. What do you think, Dr. Hassem? Yes, I think that's good enough for the animal model. We can try firing. And the other uh, usual question is when we find the uh, esophageal viruses and uh, they are the most probable cause of bleeding for the uh, nipple sign and everything. And you also find Perfect. gastric viruses, isolated gastric viruses. Manavu. Would you band esophageal and inject the gastric with histocrine at the same session or uh, separately? What do you do, uh, Dr. Tumbari? Again, Dr. Hussam, if you find the uh, gastric isolated gastric viruses mm -hmm. and esophageal viruses, which are the cause of bleeding, so you band the esophageal and inject the gastric at the same session. Yes, I, I start by injection of the gastric, then I go for banding uh, for the esophageal at the same session. That's my experience as well, because when you inject the gastric viruses, even if they are not, uh, even if they are isolated type, sometimes you find the esophageal viruses have shrunken. This is not true. What is true, Dr. Mazin? Yes, please tell us. There is no communication between those gel and gastric viruses, and I have shown this several times by histocrine injection. Never the libidol goes above the line. This is what Serene says. But if we even we read the rivers of Serene, he usually, even for junction viruses, which he said that they are communicating, if he will read those gel viruses, the junction there is not the same. So there is no communication between the oxygen and gastric virus. Another comment why bleeding gastric, sorry, increasing gastric viruses by bending is not useful because there is a deep uh, venous plexus and there is a short gastric vessel which are multiple. So if there is alteration, the surface area will not allow hemostasis and the bleeding will occur. The low, small surface area in the junction varix, or what we call GOV1, is the cause of successful bending or sclerosalary. He said that there is communication, but this actually, there is no study 
to prove that there is communication between the autophagial and the gastric viruses. And if all of us see histoacrylic injection, try to find if there is a epidural going to the autophagus, this never occurs. If you inject autophagial viruses, you will find the epidural going up, filling the whole autophagial varix, which means that the autophagial varix is one unit, while the gastric varix is not communicating with autophagial okay. varix. This is a cause that I didn't believe in serine. But I tried to publish this, but all the time they said, stick to serine. So you prefer okay. to, to inject uh, gastroesophageal junction viruses with, with histoacryl as, rather than banding? No, 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 no. Uh, gastroesophageal viruses are very small, surface area is very small. The deep venous pelex is not so uh, extensive like gastric viruses. It can be managed by banding or screw therapy even. But mm -hmm. histoacryl I use only if there is spitting to make sure that the current bleeding is low. As regard to injecting both uh, histoacryl and banding, I prefer first to inject the gastric varix in the first session and to wait after, I usually repeat the scope after seven days to make sure that the whole gastric varix is full of histoacryl. Then I bend the gastric the varix because if I go inside the esophagus with banding done before in the first week, I will displace the band, so I inject the histoacryl first, followed after one week by inspecting the gastric varix and bending the oxygen. Okay, so not in the same session. Not in the same session. To avoid slippage of the bands during looking for the gastric varix. Okay. Okay, now we are using uh, another device for band ligation, which is uh, Boston. Uh, it's a little bit different from uh, the one used by Cook. We have different handle which can be fixed here, and we have introducer which is a little bit wire, not straight like one for the Cook. And also, when we look at the uh, endoscopic view, it's have only one thread. We can keep it at usually three or six o'clock, which is better for visualization. But we have the same technique or the same idea by starting as a gastroesophageal junction. We can apply continuous section at the varix by and rotating, as mentioned by Dr. Mazin to uh, uh, insert the varix itself inside uh, uh, the band cap. Then after that, we can fire by the handle. I will not fire now because we don't have red out. The tissue is a little bit stiff and cannot be fired more, but we share the same technique and the idea, which is by continuous section till we see red out, the varix come in contact with the lens of the scope. Then we rotate the handle with keeping the suction. We rotate the handle of the band itself. We can see after that, the varex is banded or ligated with the same technique. And what do you think is the ideal interval between one session and another for band ligation? It depends on uh, the size of the varex itself and the child classification of the patient itself. Uh, usually, we start by uh, three to four weeks for large viruses. Then we can increase the inter interval with obliteration up to three to six months. Then every one year after that, it completely okay, But never below two weeks, of course. Because some are advocating for yes, some are advocating for two weeks, but when two we weeks or yes, one week even ten days. When we try this, we can uh, usually see post band ulcers. Yes, in most of the patient, not usual, but I prefer usually to have three to four weeks before uh, doing the second session. Yes. What uh, do you Surendra, think, Doctor Mazen? Surendra has uh, uh, another opinion. He said that we must inspect uh, the esophagus after two weeks because he said that two weeks. Yes. yes. If there is alteration beside a large varix, you must bend this varix at a lower level. Uh, but if there with, is with the ulcer, yeah, at the lower level, at the lower level. If the ulcer is going okay. high, okay. So you agree level. about two weeks, Dr. Mazin, not less. Not less than two weeks. Better four weeks, yes. but an inspect after two weeks. Okay. A, a, a new practice, Dr. Mazin, you do it after two weeks or maybe more. I inspect after two weeks to see, as I said, if there is ulcers and the virus is below, I bend the virus. But usually I do after four weeks, the bending. Uh, most of the cases in inspection after two weeks, I find uh, not, no problem in uh, delaying for another two weeks. This is only to avoid bleeding from large virus below an ulcer. Inspection, not bending. Bending if there is large virus with ulcer above.
this is, is uh, we have uh, was banded with small one without the red out so small part of the varix is inside the band itself but this is not the perfect one the perfect one is to fire when you see the red out when the varix come in contact with the lens of the scope you can fire so we see like this appearance after band the next so we will move now to the last the next demonstration with varices if the tissues are tough i think you can yes, inject, you can inject Saline to make a blip. Saline, yes, to make a blip, yes. Artificial we, we now, Yes, we were just demonstrating the technique itself. Now, Dr. Hussain will, uh, will demonstrate the last technique, which is uh, the Hemo spray. spray. Yes. yes. How many yes, types do we well, have for them? Do we have some well, types? One type? Yes, we type? have. No, no, we have two types. We have the original uh, Hemo spray uh, from Cook and uh, we have uh, another one. This is the uh, hemo spray handle and catheter, and the powder is a nano powder that, uh, when comes uh, when coming in contact with the mucosa, forms like a fibrin clot and closes uh, or uh, 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 alleviate the bleeding uh, temporarily. And this is a temporary technique which is most useful in um, ulcers that are bleeding uh, profusely and you cannot find the source and, uh, ident uh, and apply local treatment, or uh, again, in large areas uh, of uh, bleeding. Some, some use it for massive bleeding in esophageal viruses yes. as a temporary technique, then you can go back with band like For any that. massive bleeding yes. that you cannot localize uh, the source. Yes, and, and also for diffuse bleeding for uh, large, large malignancy surface areas. For large surface areas. Right. Of, yes, of course. Uh, the only, uh, there are very few tricks to the, uh, to the technique. Can you have uh, the catheter? Uh, but this so we will point. demonstrate outside. Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, what we have to do is we have to clean the suction channel of the scope uh, with water and dry it with air because when applying the catheter through, through the scope, unfortunately this catheter does not go through the scope. So we will demonstrate uh, outside the scope. But if, uh, in but real it life, it happens, comes with two two caster, one ten French and one seven French. Yes, according to the type of the scope you have, so you can use it with any scope, but only we have the, the hemo spray. Yes. yes, the other one. Yes, for the hemo spray. Yeah. Yes, and when you go inside the the channel, the, this channel has to be dry because otherwise you can get debris and uh, humidity inside the catheter, which will clog the the powder and uh, that does not allow the powder to go through the the catheter. So you have to clean and dry your suction channel first. And then, can you see the catheter? Okay. You can apply directly to, to the vessel when you see it yellow. Yes. Okay. So you can uh, you can see the spray coming out, and you are uh, guiding it uh, straight to the bleeding point you are seeing, or the bleeding area. If it's a larger surface area, you tend to go uh, inside, and then on your way on your way out, on your way out, you can spray circumferentially. We we have also Dr. Hussein the handle itself. You can demonstrate uh, the CO2 uh, pump itself and the powder handle. Yes, this is the easy part. <laughs> yes. Okay, this is the, the handle uh, wh where it pushes the carbon dioxide and the powder comes in, it pushes the powder inside the, the catheter. This handle is single use. Once you rotate once, you cannot because, come back out. It's exactly. only one, one time. Yes. So, um, I think we have demonstrated the uh, various hemostasis techniques that are available at the moment. And yes, but, but I think we have one last trick for hemospray is that never use suction while applying hemospray because after you spray the powder, if you suck, 
the powder may clog the scope itself. So you never use suction when using hemo spray. This is the last That's, attractor mentioned. Yes, you agree, uh, the one, agree. And the one before last, because you reminded me, how far the catheter should be from your uh, tip of the scope. Okay, so it shouldn't be very close because otherwise you can uh, uh, spray over the lens. Itself. Yes, and lose vision. So it, yes. it has to one be to two centi at least. At least two centimeters mm. outside the the scope. Okay, because it was outside. Yes. Okay, uh, we have any questions uh, about any question the, from the audience? static yes. techniques? Very good work, Dr. Sam, Dr. Kambari. This very nice demonstration. Now, if we look for this uh, questions. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Dr. Mazen. Do we have any question from the audience? Yes, yes there is a question. If we can use argon uh, also in bleeding vessel or only for superficial lesions. What do you think, Dr. Hussain? Well, for a bleeding vessel, I would uh, choose clipping. Yes. Although in literature, there is no advantage or, uh, of clipping over argon and they are uh, head to head. But I find mechanical uh, hemostatic techniques are better. Whenever I can use mechanical, I will use it. Especially for the spurting vessels, because yes. spurting vessels is difficult to apply argon or superficial coagulation over moving blood. So it's maybe for oozing or a CD blood vessel, you can use argon, but for spurting one, I think it's, you should use mechanical one. Uh, there is a question about uh, uh, large viruses, it's better to do band ligation or to use beta blockers or medical treatment. Well, in cases of bleeding, are we talking about primary no, prevention no, no. or Pri secondary primary prevention? Primary prevention. Primary prevention. Primary revenge. I would, uh, virus is bleeding, I would do band ligation. No, no, no. Yes. Then no we can combine virus. or not? No, no, primary reflexes means that. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, I think it depends. Uh, it's not just I think. I, I know it depends on the signs that you have in endoscopy for impending rupture or not. If you have those signs, I would go for prophylactic band ligation. Otherwise, uh, prophylactic uh, beta also it depends on the child classification of the patient. Yes, if we have right, uh, F2 or F3 vessels with risky sign like shared red spot or hematocystic spot, we should go for band ligation rather than medical. If the patient is small versus F1 without risky sign or easy child A classification, I can use uh, beta blocker only without doing band ligation. I think this is mentioned yes. in the guidelines. That's right. Uh, yes, for uh, because the response in the child C is bad with beta blockers and a lot of yes. applications. Uh, but in yes. child A, that's proved that both techniques can be used. Can be used uh, in child yes. A, yes, right. Uh, another question, bleeding at the procedure of wall, when to refer to surgery? That's the a tricky question. Posterior wall. Oh. Uh, right? Adjacent to the pancreas, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the, um, I don't know if there are specific differences between the ulcer being in the posterior or the uterine wall or not, but referring to surgery, uh, usually for ulcers larger than two centimeters, I would refer for surgery. Refer for, uh, for surgery. I, I think the trick for the posterior wall, the posterior is the wall is the difficulty in creating the clip itself, right, Dr. Mazen? Very tangential. Also, also yes, there is, the vessel is very large in the posterior wall. The gastrogenial artery yes. is very large, and yes. to uh, clip and to prevent the bleeding is very low. So I think we see the you know, wall ulcer, it's better to go directly to surgery if it's spurting or the ulcer is deep. Or, or embolization if, if available. Embolization. Yeah. There is uh, yes. another question uh, Could we use hemospray in GIF syndrome? As a temporary, as a temporary technique yes. only. If I have diffuse bleeding, which is uncommon or rare with uh, with give, I can use it temporary to control initially the bleeding. So I come back to do uh, either band ligation or argon, whatever yeah. the technique. But I, I think do. this will be rare because yes. with give we we don't see the massive bleeding, massive bleeding with that we would need to do any temporary uh, solution. So we can go straight ahead to, uh, with argon plasma coagulation. Yes. Yes. And usually the self theory allows you to move the scope very easily. Not like yes. ulcers, which you can't get in contact, like we see wall ulcer or uh, something which you can't come close to. It. So 
It's very expensive yes. and not uh, different from Mesut. Uh, yes. Uh, there is a question, what size of acid beyond you, you don't treat in scorpion? I didn't hear that. What well, size of the vessel beyond this size ah. you don't use a scope you go for surgery. Okay, size of the vessel or the uh, ulcer? I the think those ulcer may be more, more vessel, appropriate. I don't yeah, think uh, no vessel which is beyond the clipping, but there is yes. some studies. For the vessel, all types can be used, yes. Some studies say that the white nibble, the recurrent bleeding is higher. Peripheral yes. vessel is more recurrent bleeding than central vessel. Also, the using of Doppler, which the Prime Minister has said, the Doppler is used only to make sure that the vessel has been occluded, but not to predict the recurrent bleeding. I don't have other questions. Yes, but I, 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 I think he, he means for the ulcer itself, not the vessel, because most of the vessels cannot reach a very big size. Right. Yes. yes. But yes. we can sometimes have larger ulcer, more than two centimeter with fibrotic base, which is difficult to control mechanical with uh, the standard uh, hemoclips. So this situation, we can use the OVESCO, as you mentioned, the Professor Mazin, uh, if it's uh, uh, available, or we can use uh, thermal ablation. If both cannot control the bleeding, we go for embolization or surgery if, if not. This is true that we can't. Uh, this is true that uh, the size of the ulcer is the most important, not the size of the vessel. Yes. So yes. Uh, I think we have no more questions now. And thank you for your uh, uh, very nice work. And uh, thank you, Thomas. At the end, Thanks, I Thomas. wish uh, to thank. Uh, AstraZeneca for inviting me to moderate this session and Roya for uh, organizing very good session and for all the attendees and for uh, the professor giving the lectures and the professors giving the hands on. Thank you very much and I hope we meet soon in another meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Good to see you guys. Bye-bye. See you.